hear me? So, yeah, let's get started. All right, so yeah, welcome again um, to our Autodesk Advanced Steel webcast today. Um, we don't have very much time, so um, I'll just give you a very, very brief introduction today. So um, I'm the moderator um, for this um, webcast. Um, my name is Klaus Ströhl. Um, I'm with I'm a technical consultant with A2. Um, I will just give you that brief introduction and then in the background if you've got any questions during the webcast that Stefan Gumpert from Autodesk will do, um, just type it in, the, um, in your control panel there and I'll try to answer it on the fly. If I can't answer it straight away, I'll make some notes and um, we'll try to follow it up by emails. Right, the present, our presenter today is Stefan Gumpert from Autodesk. He's Senior Technical Sales Specialist with advanced steel. He's got a very, very in-depth knowledge about the um, Australian and New Zealand steel detailing industry and yeah, he's um, looking after the technical side um, for advanced steel for Autodesk and um, is helping us out today to do this um, webcast. So I just want to hand over to you Stefan now um, okay. give, um, have a look at the brief agenda and then yeah, off you go. So from a basic perspective, we're going to try and cover all these um, items on the agenda. Uh, as Klaus mentioned, we have a, a short window, so we may not get to the tail end of things, but we will do our best to try and see what we can cover. So we're going to cover everything from modelling to connecting to reporting to drawing, um, and if we get time, we'll talk about the interoperability between Plant 3D and Advanced Steel and Revit and Advanced Steel. Okay. Um, yep, last page about uh, A2K and their offices. As you can see, their offices are everywhere. So let's get started. <coughs> okay, so Advanced Steel is a 3D or parametric 3D modeling software based on AutoCAD. Um, at the moment, you can see here I'm running Auto Advanced Steel 2015.1 which runs on AutoCAD 2015. Um, you can see I've got a bit of a model here which I'm starting with. Um, we can do basic modeling. So, come on, wake up. So, okay, so you can see point and shoot. Um, to pick two points, you can pick a beam. You can change its size. Um, you can change the type of beam. You can see here we can switch between universal columns and universal beams. Um, we can pick other ones, we can pick other country section sizes so if you work for countries all around the world all this is available to you. Okay. We've also got a whole range of other pre-filtered objects Okay, so we've got angle, T-shape, circular hollow sections, lead purlin, flat bars, round bars, square bars, square hollow sections and again any of these you pick, pick two points and you can insert them and change the properties. You can change the cardinal point in which they're inserted on, whether a center of steel, top of steel. Um, we can rotate them. Okay. We can also come back at any time, double click on any of these objects and change all those properties. You can see we can switch to the top of steel, we can rotate the shape around. Fairly simple, um, ordinary stuff, especially if you've done any steel modeling before. Um, we can insert just plain old columns. So you can see it just puts in a column which we can then modify to suit what we want. Um, we can also, um, instead of uh, modeling steel by uh, picking two points, we can also model steel on line work. So for example, if we come and pick a handful of lines that are already drawn in our model, um, answer the question, and you can see we've placed a whole bunch of steel all in one place. We can sit to choose and change the size of the steel. We can then come in afterwards and, for example, multi-edit the shapes, change the size again, something smaller, and you can see just those two objects are then changing. Okay. Um, plate work-wise, well, we can also just model all bits of plate, no problems. Um, they're just uh, polygon type object where we can stretch by grips the plate work, the plate 
Bay has length and width properties which we can override at any time. Um, 200, you can uh, again change the positioning of which corner of the shape it's using, whether it's on the near side, far side or center line of the current UCS plane. Um, at any time we can convert the object to what's called a polygon shape, which then allows it to grab the corners and change the shape to something irregular. We can also at any stage come in and modify a plate and add an extra grip in to then allow us to change the shape altogether. So you can see from a modeling perspective, plates, shapes, fairly self-explanatory. If I was to put in an eye shape like this, um, I can also place plate that is non-planar to the current use of plane, which allows me to pick three points and the same principle happens. You can see the length and width is automatically calculated by the three points that I pick. Um, just from a simple uh, plate perspective, um, if we have two bits of plate, and I was to copy this plate, 10 mil up, and then maybe move this along, what we can do is we can come in and connect those two plates with bolts. So we can come in and we can say, right, from a bolt perspective, Let's go and grab these two bits of plate and go from this end point to that end point. <coughs> Move that along. And you can see that I'm going in and out of this dollar box. Very nice in interoperability. We can switch to a different grade of bolt. Let's say A is 12.2, which are 8.8 .8 volts. Um, we can choose whether it's to be sight bolted or shot bolted. Um, we can change the edge distances from the corners that I picked. And you can see I'm starting to get a bit of a collection of bolts. Uh, maybe I want to have three in that direction. No, change my mind. I want to have two. I want to go three in the other direction. And you can see very quickly that um, I'm bolting this stuff together. If I was to decide to add this, bring another piece down, 20 mil, um, what I can do is I can also say, look to this group of bolts here, pick this plate, and you can see quickly that the bolts have now lengthened or changed. You can also come into the properties and override the type of hole that is in each bit of plate. You can see in this piece of plate, or that bit of plate, or this bit of plate. You can actually change the type of hole to be a slotted hole or a counterfunk hole or whatever. So, you know, maybe the middle piece of plate we want to have a slotted hole. And, you know, so then when we have a look at this plate now, we close this. And look at this piece of plate, you can see it's got a lot of holes. You look at the top piece of plate, and you can see it's only normal holes. So you've got a lot of flexibility and control. But, I mean, this is what we're showing you here is just a simple manual procedure for modeling. Okay? We also have built-in connections. Okay, so start off here. <coughs> so we have something called the connection bolt. In the connection bolt, we have a whole range of connections. Uh, different categories. There's around 200 odd connections categorized into a whole range of different types of connections. So you can see we've got a whole bunch of base type connections, okay, ranging from uh, all sorts of un unusual ones for possibly the Chinese or the American market uh, through to the old plain simple ones that we use here in Australia. Um, but again, doing work overseas, flexibility is there. <coughs> Simple end plates connecting to concrete. We've got stiffness, stiffness of the UCS, so you can see your stiffness at any old angle you like. Um, then we've got some internal baffle stiffness, so if you could do box girder sections with plate stiffness inside, we've got all those. Um, you can see we've got a whole range of knee connections uh, for a portal frame. Um, some very, very complex, some not so complex. So you can see you can scroll up and down here, you've got a whole range of different connections. Apex connections. Well, what do you want to do? You want to have you know, apex at the roof, splice connections, um, moment end connections, uh, clip angles, web angles, end plates. Um, we've also got shear plates and shear plates of any size you like. Um, angle bracing. You know, if you want a single gusset uh, plate, uh, do you want to have an in, uh, sorry single bracing gusset with a base plate or an end plate? Just a single gusset by itself. Do you have two braces coming in? Do you have three braces coming in? Um, do you have, is it flat bar bracing? Is it pipe angle bracing? Um, or is it pipe bracing? Same scenario for pipe bracing. Okay. Um, or what I would refer to as 
tube bracing, which covers circular hollow section and square hollow section. We've got connections for wind bracing. So you've got uh, uh, you know, your rod bars with your D-shackles and washers. Again, all different variations. Um, turnbuckle bracing, as you can see here, all different uh, variations. We've got a whole range of curling connections from um, normal curls with fly bracing without fly, uh, without fly bracing, hip and belly connections, um, two curling with fly bracing on both sides, lap connections, um, all sorts of different types of connections. Okay, we've also got a, what they refer to as miscellaneous connections, like stair base connections, um, handrails, um, stair connections at the top of stringers, um, post connections for handrail. Um, Again, as you can see, there's a whole range of connections. If you come here, you can see I've got a connection here that we can just quickly look at. And you can see that, based on what you can see there, I have a single-sided end plate. I have a whole range of features that I can change. So we've got features that we can change for notches. So for the top notch, for the bottom notch. Um, and again, you, you can see that the graphic um, has these numbers in the dimensions, and the numbers on the dimensions follow the options on the main dialog box. Um, plates and holes, you know, what do you want sort of an in place? Do you want a tolerance gap for the direction? What are your fault specifications? As in what grade do you want to use? Again, we come back to that list. So we go and find our um, A is twelve fifty two. 8.8, I want a nut and two washers. You want to have the bolts inverted, and then we can flip the bolts around the other way. Um, again, do you want to have a slotted hole? Maybe you want a slotted hole in the column. Maybe you want a slotted hole in the end plate. You can choose to have in both, in either of them or all of them. Okay? Horizontal dimensions, you want to control the, how do you want to control the horizontal dimensions? By the bolt edge distance, by projection, by total. You can see lots of different options for modifying these. Um, connections. Do we want to allow a stiffener at the top? Okay, in this case no, but in other cases we may want to have a stiffener at the top. Okay. Once you have all these settings done, we have this library option, and this library option can, is available in all the different connections that are available. And at any point you can import these values um, into your library, and then you can edit the library and come to our last known entry that we've entered, give it a name, my end plate, oops, my end plate, click OK, and as you can see, I've now saved that end plate. Now the beauty of this end plate is, um, and you just have to ignore the section size for the moment, this is a, a European model, um, the, if I ever get to a situation where the column is this size, and the rafter or beam is this size. By default, the software will select this template for you. Um, so if you put some effort into your library up front, we can also sit down and build up a good collection of connections that can be reused at any time. All these connections are stored in an access database or a series of access databases, and the access databases can be stored on the server for central access to all your employees. Now, um, we can just keep creating one connection at a time, but we can also copy connections. So, for example, uh, we may choose to come in and pick this connection and say we want to copy it to this location and this location. Okay, and you can see I get to copy the connection. Or, um, if you wanted to, delete that, okay. We can also copy by multiple. So we can pick, again, the connections we want to copy. Um, we want to pick the locations of where you want to copy the connection to. So we get those two columns and those two beams, click enter, and as you can see, I've got a new connection this end and this end. You can see quickly by manipulating what you have in the model, we can quickly go and add more connections quite freely and readily, okay? Um, we can also do things like, if I go and delete this connection, okay, you can see if I delete the connection, it just 
reverse the field back to its original form. We can also go and use the copy by group option, which allows us to create a parent-child relationship. Okay, so in this case, you can see that this connection has four rows of bolts, and so does this one. Okay, if we edit this connection and come in and change our bolts, our vertical holes, and we say, before we do this, we'll just bring this across a little bit. Okay, as you can see, I've got four rows in each. Change this to three, click OK, and you can see this connection has changed and this connection has changed at the same time. Because I've now created what's called a joint group, I have a parent-child relationship, and this is the master and this is the slave. However, at any stage, we can come in and go to the joint properties, change this one to the master, and the other one becomes a slave. So hence, we can then come in and change more information, so make it 25 mil thick, and this one has changed 25 mil thick, and it can come across, so it's this one. So there's a little bit about our connection side of things. Okay, so let's just go and place another connection here, connection bowl. Change our set out to five meters, for 
example, and you can see that the connection is moving with it, everything with it. Okay. Um, show you again. Close, click, close, there we go. And you can see we've got joint on a joint, and from the spacing size things, four and a half meters, and you can see that the base plate has moved with it. So there's a lot of interoperability between joints. So this is like a child job of a parent, or if you like. Okay. Um, we've also got three hinged. So again, same sort of dial box, except this time we're talking about a portal frame. Same sort of um, idea when it comes to the um, set out and size. So we can override that four meters. Now that off to five meters, and you can see I'm starting to get. Um, maybe I make this three and a half, and you can see the picture of, of what we're modeling is changing as we go. Okay. Right. Um, we've also got uh, a range of truss functions. So you can see again um, talking about you know is the alignment with the top or the bottom of the cord? Is it going to be straight? Is it going to be curved? Um, is the bottom also going to be curved? Or straight, okay. Um, you can see here from the graphics in the dialog box, you've got the set out information for the uh, top cords for the verticals on the end. Then you've got the web members. Are the web members going to be um, Pratt, half Pratt, or a Warren type set out? Um, how is the ends going to be adjusted? Okay. So are the ends going to be aligned flush? So you've got exact cut, you've got exact aligned. You can move the distance. You can see here at the moment I've got a 100 mil gap at this base here. If I set that to zero, you can see it sets out the truss quite nicely, quite quickly. Again, in this scenario, we can come in and use connections, say, you know, a double gusset type connection, um, or maybe from the tube bracing, we may choose to come in and put some tube connections in here now um, and produce some sort of a combination between the joint of the truss and the joint of the, uh, the tube bracing. Um, we've got joist macros um, where we can have double sections. Whoa, let's go all the way around. You can see we've got uh, two different uh, bottom cord and top cord members. Okay, again, follow the geometry, you're sort of starting to get a bit of a feel for how the um, dialog box is and everything. Okay. All right, so that, that's sort of a bit of the extended modeling type of thing. Um, we do have also one other feature that I was going to show you, and that is stairs. So if we would pick start an end point for our stairs, um, pick the alignment method. There we go, up comes the dollar box, and you can see it's starting to produce some sort of a stair. You can adjust the length, width, height, how it's all set out. Is it calculated by length and angle, height and angle, length and height? Um, stringer sizes, you can see I'm using 200 PFCs in this case. Um, the type of thread that you're using, and as you can see, there's 24 different styles of threads that you can use here. Some, you know, for example, we go to type four. We've now got ourselves a different style of tread. Um, if you come and have a look, you can see you've got a little bit of a bracket bolted underneath. And on the top, we go to the properties. We have a piece of timber. Okay. Um, we lift that piece of timber. We can see that it's a 240 by 40 piece of tread. Okay. Um, go back to that dollar box. Again, uh, after you've chosen your treads. Um, you can also sit down and adjust your landings. So for example, the top landing, uh, we've got the option to adjust either side. So if we go 1,000 on one side, you can see it extends over there. 1,000 on the next side. I actually I made a side and I don't want to do that. I'll leave that at 250 because I'm going to now model in uh, a cross member across here and then have another flight of stairs going up. So you can see you can control both sides. Um, so the first thing that stands out is the stair has no connection. But if you remember in our um, connection bolt, 
we have a range of miscellaneous connections where we can sit, for example, and do the anchor connections at the base. Um, close that. Pick one of our legs and remove. And you can see quickly it's producing a connection for me at the base. We can again change options in here, whether we want to have a vertical leg, no vertical leg, um, how you want to cut it back, both the plate and the shape, um, cut size 100, and you can see starting to change a little bit of what's happening at the end here. Okay, So you can sort of get a bit of an idea on the joint stuff. Um, we also have um, handwriting. So for example, if I pick one, two, three, four members, I want to put in a handrail, come in and pick a start point, and we'll pick an end point, say there, and then we go, yep. So what you can do is you can see we've got a range of handrails in there. Um, from the library, I've got a couple of samples here of what I can show you, what we can do. So we've got one sort here, we've got another sort here, and as you can see, every time I pick one element from that library, this is that library I was talking about before, it saves away all the settings, and you can recall those settings anytime you like. And you can get as simple or as complicated as you like. You can see in some cases, like here for example, you can see we've got a railing on the inside as well as a railing on the top. So from a perspective of architectural handrail, you can see it's quite um, interesting to have a look at. Okay. The handrails themselves, because they're actually connected to the um, because they're actually connected to the steel, when you pick the two steel members and take the grip of the floor steel and move the floor steel, for example, you can see that the handrail moves with it because of the connection or the intelligence of that joint that it moves from one side to the other. Okay. Um, all right. I think that sort of gives everyone a fairly interesting idea on modelling steelwork. We also have a lot of uh, interesting stuff when it comes to plate work. So uh, from a plate work perspective, uh, we can go from a circle to another circle, pick, 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 put in an accuracy for modelling, and you can see it's, it's um, modelled a conical bit of plate that's eccentric. Okay, there is a start and end point to this plate. If I actually give, um, say yes, so what you can do is if I pick this, you can see there's the unfolding pattern of that plate. Okay, erase that. You can actually change this plate. We switch to our 2D wireframe. Come in and we we'll remove a couple of these joints. From our plate, delete, switch back to our realistic mode. You can see I've now got one bit of plate, two bit of plate, three bit of plate, and any of these bits of plate I can choose to come and get um, pick, pick that. Yes, and there you can see that's the unfolding of that single bit of plate. These unfoldings also come out on drawings as part of the default. So if you do do conical plate, you can produce the development or unfolded bit of plate on a drawing. Again, with a conical bit of plate, we don't have to go from circle to circle. We can choose to go rectangular to circle. And again, put in accuracy. You can see again, we've got the option of determining which side of the line or which side of the profile the contour will go. You can go the far side, the near side, or the mean. Click OK. And you can see I'm going squared around here. Um, we can also come in, for example, and take this standalone bit of plate and this standalone bit of plate and choose to create a folded bit of plate. One, two. And you can see I've now got a nice big bit of plate. Um, I may choose to come in and Connect those two up as well, and I've now got this big folder bit of plate. 
And just like that before, like I showed you before, if I pick this bit of play, I choose to unfold it, pick the unfolding, you can see from here, there you go, you can see that the shape of the unfolded bit of plate, if you were going to make that piece of plate out of one big giant bit of plate. All right, so there's a little bit on plate work. Um, the plate work stuff is also quite extensive. We've got lots of uh, splitting and joining options. Um, if you just put a single bit of plate down and have a look at some of those features, you can see that you know we can sit and just do standard old things like crop the corners. Okay, um, again, nice dialog box, very graphically driven. Put in the size you want to have. So, for example, 20, 20. Okay, if you decide you don't want that anymore, all you've got to do is click the feature and you're back to square one. Um, we can sit and put cuts and holes in there. Um, we could, for example, copy that and choose to. Say I want to make two bits of bolted plate out of that, and say I want to join this edge with that edge at say 33 degrees, and you can see here straight away I can adjust the radius 50, okay, and you can see there's a bit of plate bolted bracket with a modification on it. Um, we can choose to modify that modification, and even though it's in a child size. Um, you can see quite quickly I can choose to modify that. All those modification features still work um, pretty self-explanatory. All right. So that's a little bit about plate work modeling. We've got default grading sizes, standard grading, variable grading, so all your WebForge catalogs are already existing in the software. We've also got the option to model up. Here we go. Um, Symmetrical welded beams, so for example if I pick here, pick two points, you can see that I've got this compound section made out of three plates. Um, I can sit and choose what different types of shapes that I want it to use. So for example I can go to the Australian flat bar, use a 150 by 5 flat and you can see the shape of the plate is changing, excuse me. Control the welding, you can control the positioning of everything. Um, this is all stored in a database, material grade, decoding, self-explanatory. Um, we've also got double sections, so we can produce, for example, back-to-back -back channels as a single beam, um, which allows you to then model two pieces at the same time and modify two pieces at the same time. We can also drop those at any time. Um, we can disassemble them to single shapes, and now I've got two single beams that I can modify just like I did before. Um, the other one that we can do that's quite interesting is the welded beam or plate web girders where you're actually making the beam out of lots of different bits of plate um, where we can control, for example, the segment length. We can add more segments in. Okay, close that and you can see that I've now got um, four segments. Stretch that out. We can modify any segment at any point. So we've got segment one, two, and three. We can choose what flange sizes we're going to use, um, whether there's any tapering changes in the flanges on the top and the bottom, what happens at this location where the plates are. Are we going to have some joins? Are we going to have some openings for weldings? Um, what type of welding we want to do? Again, you can, you're starting to get a bit of a feel. The control is quite good. And again, at any point in time, we can disassemble that back down to single components. Um, these objects, which are made out of multiple plate sizes, can be materialistic, angle drawn as single objects or as uh, separate beams. Okay, so for example, it can be model, it will be drawn as a single beam, but it will be materialistic as one, two, three, four, five, six bits of plate. Okay, so again, quite a range of features there. All right, let's have a little bit more of look at the documentation side of things. So in the way of uh, numbering, numbering in, in advanced steel is very simple and is very configurable. Okay, here's a configuration that um, I tend to use when I'm doing a demonstration. So I'm going to start my single part at 1,000. I'm going to start my assemblies at 100. But I'm going to make sure that 
all my numbers have four zeros or four numbers in them all together so that the sequencing of uh, the 100 series runs before the 1000. I hit OK and it goes through and numbers all the components. We can see there's all my part marks, there's all my assembly marks, and away we go. All right. Um, the other thing with the numbering is we can have a feature called standard parts. So, for example, if you have a drawing with some standard components in it and they've got their own numbers, we can choose to say, you know, include this generic, these two generic numbers for numbering, and if it finds any parts in the model that compare to any of those external PWGs, it will get those numbers when numbering rather than a fabricated number. So if you've got standard components, well, excellent. Okay. So one thing you can see here is Advanced Steel has a document manager. And the document manager takes care of all the drawings, all the reports, and all the exchange files for DXF and NC. So when producing DXF files for laser cutting or plasma cutting, we can produce those, and we produce NC files for beamline machines. So from a perspective, uh, the document manager retains the link between the model and the um, documents. Okay. So for example, let's come in and we'll grab, say, this column and quickly produce a drawing of this. So we might come in and say, look, let's produce a single part drawing of well, this beam here. Use, and just from a perspective, there's my title. Stick it on a single part drawing of an A3. Actually, put it on an A4. One document number one. Click OK. Save. When we come back into our document manager now, under details, you can see we have drawing one. From in our document manager, we can come and we can preview what's in the drawing. Uh, we can double click to open it, <coughs> and you can see the drawing is open. Now, one thing you can see here is it's fully dimensioned. Um, you've got complete control over scales per views, you can rotate them, um, you can adjust whether there's clipping or no clipping. So at the moment, you can see we've got clipping, I can choose to turn that off, um, click OK, and come back, it reprocesses the view on the spot and changes the clipping. Um, I might choose to turn the clipping off, um, turn it back on for everything, and you can choose to turn it off globally for everything. Okay, so if I pick OK, come back in, it's now unclipped for both views. One thing you see here, the drawing is too small. Let's save, come back into our pocket manager. We can sit and say, let's change the prototype from single part A4 to a single part A3. Done. All right, come into our drawing, open it up, and it's now on an A3 border, and away you go. Okay, so you can see how the document manager can control that stuff quite quickly. Same column, we can pick it, and go to our quick documents, we can sit down and produce an assembly drawing of a beam, or well, in this case it's a column, but it's a, the term beam is just referring to a beam. Pick use, again, pick a scale, label size, and label um, information. So the label is <coughs> made up of a series of what's called tokens, so you can grab a whole range of information from the model, from the saw length to the quantity to the part number to the material grade to the lot and phase, the length, whatever you like. You can combine this in a title, pick OK. Again, stick it on a drawing, maybe on an A2. It'll be drawing number two. Pick OK, save. And when I come to my document manager, I've now got two drawings. We have a look at drawing number two. Easy, no problem. Okay, we've already got a view on the end plate here, but let's say, for example, we want to produce a section on this area here. So what we can do is we can, excuse me, come in and produce a section here. Enter from a pick, and I want to look that far, and we'll just take the automatic information from the view because we don't need to do anything specific. Sit down and wait and the software will go and reread the model. You can see there it's produced my section. I can then move it down to wherever I want, and away you go. Pretty easy self-explanatory. The um, dimensions
dimensions themselves are advanced field dimensions. So if I double click, um, the dimensions have got properties, and you can see if I change, I can switch to absolute, which is now running dimensions or relative running dimensions all the way along. We can have running dimensions from the other end. So for example, start to zero from this end. Okay. Um, we can have level information. So you can see the column is at uh, zero, then that's elevation ten, and that's just reading the lead level from within the model. We can choose to delete dimensions at any time or put more dimensions in. So, for example, I can come in and put parametric dimensioning on here, and choose to go from here to here. Start that again. Parametric dimensioning from here. Enter. Click. Go to here. Go back to here. Go to here. So oh, hang on, I've changed my mind. I've missed this hole here. And I've missed this end plate here. Click. And you can see quite quickly it's added all those dimensions in. You may sit down and go, well, hang on, I don't really want one of those dimension points. You can sit down and say, look, I want to delete that. And delete the dimension and it recalculates all the dimensions for you on the fly. All these dimensions that you manually modify, add and delete, all those dimensions, or all those changes are retained even if the model size or model changes. Okay. So let's say something does happen. Okay. So for example, we may sit down and say, let's now yeah, got a bigger size. Click OK, save. What happens? Well, what happens is we come back into our document manager and it, my document quickly tells me, look, the single part drawing and the assembly drawing are both out of date and they both need updating. We haven't issued them yet, so let's force the update. Click OK, come back in and you can see all that stuff there. Okay, all the material list, everything is updated, away you go. Alright, um, let's say for example we come and add a notch to the drawing now. Okay, so we come in and we place a notch on the corner and we'll make it a nice big size, let's say 100 by 100. Okay, nice big notch, save. Renumber because possibly something could have changed. Okay, if something has changed, it'll tell me. Come back into that document manager again. It knows they need updating. This time round, though, we've already issued the drawing to the client. So what we're going to do is we're going to update with a revision. And in the revision, we're going to put in who did the revision. Notch added. Click OK. And what it's doing is going to update. One thing that you'll notice is when I open up the drawing, you can see that, uh, where's my notch gone? Right, it hasn't shown the notch, it needs to put an extra view in, so we need to come in and place the top view on, click OK, and away you go, there's my view. Okay, close that, save that. That's probably a bad example because that's a well put, not a notch. Um, but you understand the idea. At the same token, I can pick any of these components, for example, and we can produce the MC file. So if we pick these elements and now come back to our document manager, you'll see under the MC file we have those MC files created. Okay. At the same time, we can pick any of those plates. See here, pick and come into our output and under MC we can produce the DXS plate, come back to our document manager and you can see you've got another area under here for plates. Okay. With the DXS you can choose to see the actual plate, you can see the scribing information there, um, you can see the part numbers included in the scribing, it's all pretty good. Okay. Dave, um, what about reporting? Okay. We can do that too. Again, we've got a process in here called under templates or um, part lists. So, for example, we can do material list, plate list, saw list, um, stud list, special part list, um, grating list, whatever you like. Um, structured list. So, give me an erection, sem uh, erection bolting list, or a structured list, a shipping list. Um, 
bridging list, you name it, we've got it in there. All these can be modified and customised to suit. So, for example, if I go and say I want to use a wait list, hit use, it'll go and do model extraction, as you can see here. When it's finished, up comes the list. You can see there's a class, all the reports of all the listings. We can choose to export this list to PDF, to rich text format, HTML, XLS, TIFF, or just plain old text. Um, and we can choose to save this report into our system. And, yep, where does the report end up? You've got it in the document manager. Okay, under here, document manager, you've got your bill of materials. Um, pick on it, you can see a bit of a preview of it um, as you go through it. Okay. Um, so, as, you, as I showed you there, documents, reporting, DSTV, or your NC files, and your DXF files are all linked back to the model. Um, yeah, all right. So, the last thing that we need to show you is some um, GA type documentation. So, we can also do general arrangements or details. So, for example, if we come into drawing styles, and maybe we're going to come into here and see the different, maybe holding down bulk plan, hit use, click OK, and we're going to stick it on a 1, going into 3, and we're going to come in and say we want to take the extent of that view. Click OK, it's processed, and come into our document manager, drawings, up to date, going into 3, and get, we get a bit of a drawing coming. You can see we've missed out part of view, but that's deliberate. Okay. Again, here you can see the dimensions on this particular base plate, just based on the connections and bits and pieces that we've used previously. Okay. Save, close. Again, the, these documents, if something changes, i.e. we change the joint on this column, and maybe we might just change the thickness of the plate, go to 20, close, save, again, renumber, click OK, just to double check to make sure we haven't got any missed components, come into our document manager, our marking plan needs updating, uh, force the update, and again, come into 3, and you should be able to see, there we go, the drawing is back up to date again. Um, we can do details, so for example, let's go and find, let's do a, a detail on there. Quickly, we're running out of time. So what we might do is set our UTS to our view and move our origin to our endpoint here. Come into our quick documents again. And maybe we want to show a GA block detail, views. What scale do we want to use? Just to change the name, whatever we like. So you can see here we can put the XXX on the bottom, for example. Click OK. Select all the objects I want to include in my view. Pick a drawing to put it on. And we might put it on an A1. And say, I just want to see that extent there. Click OK. So again, come to our document manager. And we can see we've got drawing 4. Drawing 4, I want a pretty, a much bigger detail, so let's go 1 is to 5, click OK. On the fly, it'll just reprocess the view for you. Um, we also might decide um, not to scale, get rid of that title, and we may choose to go, let's now have no hidden details, click OK, and again, it just recalculates on the fly. Okay. We can delete any of these flags if we want. And let's say we'll delete these members as well. Click OK. Maybe we don't want to see this one. And then all we do is our, come into a label dimension and say update the detail. And try that again. Pick. And what it does, the grey boxes tell you there's other objects behind. And you can recalculate the view based on what you've deleted. Okay. Any point in time, I can sit down and say, not on that one on the little box below it. I can say restore the erased elements, click OK, recalculate, and all the erased parts come back into play. Click 
save. So the only other things we can do with the document manager, and it's quite nifty, we can say, for example, on my marking plan, I really want to see this detail, so we can drag this over to number three, open up number three, and now we've got our detail drawing on number three. All right, so click save. The one last thing to talk about, um, and it's really just to do with the single parts and assembly creation, um, is the fact that I showed you manual creations. But we can actually say, for example, um, we'll use that one, we'll use maybe that theme, that theme, that theme, and that theme. Come into our quick documents and use a process rather than a detailed drawing style and say, put me in all those parts, single sheet output, start from drawing four, uh, let's start from drawing 100, and we'll use the selected single part. Click OK. OK, and you can see off it goes, processing away. Go to the document manager, and you can see now it's produced a drawing for all those bits and pieces, all dimensioned in one process. So the first round of um, drawings that I showed you, the manual way of creating it, what I just showed you then was the automatic process, if you like. On the same token, um, you can also notice that these two here were the same, and it didn't produce a drawing twice, it only produced a drawing once. At the same token, you can also process assemblies in the same way. So for example, I'll go single sheet output, and I might start my drawing with about 1,000 from the selected main parts, hit OK. Again, it'll sit down and process everything it needs to do. Save, document manager, come back in, and you can see I've got a whole range of drawings. I double click and open, you can see I've got the, um, the drawing there. Now I may decide I don't want some of those, as I showed you before, you can just come in and delete some of the dimension points. You may say, well, I don't want to mention that or that. Okay. And quickly you can modify everything that you need to do. All right. Um, the drawing size are obviously configurable, so are the labels, um, the titles. Um, all right, so, um, yeah, Klaus, do we have any questions that need to get answered after all that? So, um, thanks Stefan, so far. Um, I just had one question that I wasn't 100% sure about. Um, do we have, one second, I just got to go back to the questions. Um, if we do have... Um, um, Webforge um, railings in the Australian Library. Okay, yep. At the moment, there is nothing specific to WebForge Railing, but there is an app coming uh, in the next week or so which is going to be specific to um, uh, WebForge Railings, which is specific to, um, which will be available in the App Store um, developed by a third party. We can do WebForge Railings um, with using the Railings command that you need to put some effort in to create the posts and staunchons a little bit more extensively. The railings macro that you see here in this application is more tailored towards the architectural style hand railing. All right, cool, thank you. So it's going to be available via third party um, on the App Store very soon, it looks like. Yep. So, so yeah, yeah, I think no, um, all the other questions here, that yeah. were out, I um, all of the other questions I think I was able to um, respond to so far, so yeah, you can okay. go ahead, thank you. No worries. Yeah, well that's, that's, that's sort of the extent of what I was going to show you. Um, for those of you who are not aware of the App Store, just like we do on our phones these days, Autodesk have an App Store where you can go and look at apps made by various third parties, uh, ranging from anything from AutoCAD to Revit to um, Advanced Steel, you name it, it's all out there. All right. Um, so, um, 
Are you able to quickly um, show um, the rough workflow about um, working with Revit yep. and advanced steel? That'd be great. Yep. And that's what I, what not, I can, what at I least talk. some of the um, some of the attendees are interested in. Okay. So within advanced steel, we have a huge range of export and import capabilities. So, firstly, from an export import, just on a general perspective. We have support for IFC files, CIS2 or SimSteel2, SDNF, um, export import features. Okay. We also have the ability to, to export PSS and KISS format and the PML format. So if any of the applications you're working with support those applications, um, uh, the export is supported there. We can also export via a 3D DWF straight to Navisworks, which exports the properties from the object through a 3D DWF into Navisworks. Um, from the Revit uh, perspective, um, with Revit we have an export, import and synchronization feature. So if you're working together with an architect, for example, or someone using Revit structures, um, you have the ability from Revit to export to this GTCX format. The GTCX format can be imported into Advanced Steel, which will then generate a model with you, for you. The options or the, the shapes that are created inside your model retain a unique identifier and, and then you can modify, do your connections, do drilling, cutting, modifications, you can add more steel, you can delete steel, and then you can re-export your model back via the same GTX, GTCX file format, which will then allow the Revit user on the other end to use the synchronize option to synchronize with the uh, exported file. And the Revit user can then say, oh, okay, these main pieces of steel here have been modified. These main pieces have been deleted, and these main pieces are new. And the user can option opt to synchronize, import, or delete the sticks of steel to update their model based on the changes that you've made in advanced steel. Um, this can go either Revit to advanced steel to Revit, or it can go advanced steel to Revit and back to advanced steel. So you can go either bi-directionally as much as you like. The other um, export feature that we have is we have the ability to take the advanced steel model via the object enabler to Plant 3D. So if, for those of you who are using Plant 3D, you can export the stick model that is produced in Plant 3D via STNF and can be imported uh, into advanced steel via STNF. You can then make, you can do everything you need to do in advanced steel and because Plant 3D has the object, you can install the object enabler for the um, Plant 3D for Advanced Seal. Once the model is then complete in Advanced Seal, we are then able to just do a straight XREF of this file into our Plant model, and Plant 3D will recognize those objects and will be able to create orthographic drawings together with its piping stuff, together with your uh, steel work that you've modeled in Advanced Seal. So there's quite a lot of uh, flexibility of whether you go to Revit, whether you go to Plant, depending on the market you're working in, to uh, work with that. And again, the next release of this product, and that'll all be enhanced again and again. So there's, there's quite an extensive um, uh, work being done on the collaboration between Revit and Plant 3D. Hopefully that's all right. up information. Mm -hmm. Th thank you. Um, I've got one last question, so it's almost we're almost at the end of the webcast. Um, Gary has asked, can you alter the drawing styles? If so, how difficult is this to do? Um, the drawing styles can definitely be modified. Um, in fact, the drawing styles are very extensive uh, in their modification. Normally, it wouldn't be something you would do after doing basic training. It's a, a separate um, training class that we do. You can see here, if I come down to any drawing style, you've got the ability to control front view, top view, bottom view, then for the bottom view, um, which objects get shown in the bottom view, 
how they are shown in their presentation, are they labelled? So the control in the drawing styles is very, very effective. Um, the delivered drawing styles that are coming with the package um, are customised quite extensively towards the Australian market. In particular, the 216 release that's coming is the, is the next one. Um, every year there's a lot of money spent on countryfication for this product. Um, and at the moment, one of the key focuses of Autodesk is the countryfication for the Australian market and the US market. So there's always new stuff coming, and there's always stuff there that uh, of a good standard or a good base to start from as a user. All right, excellent. So um, thank you very much, Stefan. I think we're at the end of the webcast now. Um, yep. If anyone has got any further questions, um, yeah, feel free to flick us an email, and I'll try to follow that up. Um, yeah, I hope this webcast get um, get you guys an, a good overview and some appetite to um, see more. And if you've got any further questions, yeah, let us know, and we'll get in touch with you. Um, anything you want to comment on, Stefan? No, if you want to see more, let me let let Klaus know, and if I can help you out, I will. Um, or if you guys can do it on your own, that's okay too. Happy to always help. Excellent. All right. So, um, yeah, have a great um, afternoon and have a good lunch and thanks for your time watching this. Have a good one. Bye.